I've asked some young ladies to help me out, so if uh, Ashton and Emma and Lois and Ginger would go ahead and come on up, have a seat up on stage up here. Give them a hand for coming up without knowing what they're getting into. Go ahead and take that out. <laughs> All right, and here's a high-tech eraser, too. Okay, now here's what we're going to do. First of all, I need to know. I'm going to grab a microphone here, so in case we want to. The first question is, is uh, how old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen? Eleven. Eleven, and I'm not going to ask. <laughs> but I will ask, which, which one of you is the older sister? Okay. All right, so we have a 13-year-old, 11-year-old, and an older sister and a younger sister. Okay, we got that. And what, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a little, uh, oh, I guess you could call it a quiz or a survey kind of thing. And what they're going to do, and I don't want you to cheat. I don't want you to, to look at each other's answers. But what I want you to do is I want to ask you a question, and I want you to write it down on the board. And when I tell you to show us, go ahead and show it to us so we can see what it is. And we're going to just, and, and it's, it's going to be about each other, okay? So the questions are going to be about your sister. All right? That's a pain, isn't it? Let me help you out. There you go. Thank you. you bet. All right. Okay, the first question is this. I want you to describe your, and don't cheat, by the way, okay? Describe your sister's personality in one word. <laughs> do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Or for, it could be a phrase. It could, if it's not one word, it could be a phrase. No pressure. The game does start at noon, though. Okay. Are you ready? All right, I want you to, at the count of three, I want you to turn around and show us. I'm going to have to read because I wrote kind of small. So on the count of three, one, two, three, turn it around. Spunky is what she wrote about Emma. And quietish is what she wrote. Vibrant, okay, that's a good word for the personality. And quiet and reserved, all right? Okay, very good, okay. Now, here's the, here's the second thing. Go ahead and erase that. Now, write down one thing that is the biggest difference between you and your sister. The thing that's different, most different about you. I'm excited about some of these answers. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three, turn it around. Height is the biggest difference. <laughs> Don't think she liked that too much. Personality is a difference. Personality and she's neat, I'm not. Okay, I like that. Good, good, good answer. Okay, go ahead and erase it again. Now write the thing that makes you, that's most similar about you and your sister. What is the most similar thing about you and your sibling? These are tough questions. No pressure. I'll help her out a little bit. All right, let's start down here on the count of three. One, two, three. What does this one say? Our background, okay. We think alike. Very good. We're sisters, okay. They have that in common. And I helped her out. Last name is the thing that's most similar about Emma and Ashton. Okay. Here's the one. I want you to write down the name of either sister here 
the one who gets or got the most attention? Maybe from mom and dad or whatever. Who gets the most attention? Let's see if we can get some fights going here. If they have to think about it, it's a good sign, I think, right? Lois is writing the first chapter of her new book. <laughs> okay, on the count of three, one, two, three. Emma loves the spotlight, she said, Ashton says. Emma agrees that she gets the attention. You don't know, she doesn't know, and each of us in different areas. Okay, all right, very good. Okay, here's the last one. This is the toughest one probably, though. Write down the name of the sister that is the good sister. Which one is the good sister? Get some help from the peanut gallery out there. Who is the good sister? All right, on the count of three, one, two, three, go. Ashton, Riley said, <laughs> Riley said her, okay, so Ashton's the good sister here. Me, of course, is what Ginger says. And Lois does not disagree. So <laughs> thank you, ladies. Give them a round of applause. You guys can go have a seat now. Put this back up. You can even keep your thing as a parting gift if you'd like. Now, I, I think sibling relationships uh, can be quite entertaining if you think about it. Uh, I love stories that, you know, of good-natured sibling rivalries and the dynamics of the different personalities interacting as, you know, as you kind of grow up and discover your own identity. And it's amazing how we can hear stories about sibling disputes that you would often think, you know, there's just no way. If that, if that happened in your life, how could you ever talk to one another ever again? You heard stories like that? And it's just like, how, did that, how do you still remain in a relationship that can survive that? But oftentimes those sibling relationships and those sibling rivalries de develop into things that are, are some of the strongest friendships on the face of this earth. Uh, take my, me and my sister, Lindsay, for example. We could not stand each other growing up. Could not stand each other growing up. In, in fact, uh, we have stories to prove that, actually. Uh, I remember one time she was on the phone with uh, a friend of hers, and I was being the big brother and bothering her as much as I could. And, and so uh, she was in her room, and I went up to her to bother her, and I reached up and I put my hand up on the door like this, the door jam, and I started, you know, being a big brother. And so she decided that she didn't want me in her room, and so she closed the door. The problem is, is that my fingers were between the door and the door jam. Now, most people, when you realize that you're closing someone's fingers in the door, would back off and let them get their fingers out. But when my, I said, ow, my fingers are, the, are in the door, my sister proceeded to push harder <laughs> and try to go ahead and latch the door, you know, for good measure. Uh, but I did get kind, of, kind of get even with her. A few years, years later, I, I kind of sort of got even, to her, even with her when I, I tricked her into wearing uh, a dog shock collar fully functional dog shock collar, and, and she wore it even in spite of the fact that there were two big metal things sticking out, you know, and I got her to wear that. So, but, but yet, in spite of those, that's a story I'll tell you sometime, it's a good one, but um, in spite of those stories, in spite of those instances in our, in our relationship, I love my sister, and she loves me, and we are, we are good friends today. And so those relationships can be kind of uh, uh, entertaining, but I also love how sibling, sibling relationships can be educational. One thing I love about it, and, and that uh, having three kids and, and having, uh, you know, multiple kids, I, it's really cool to see them interact with one another, and their strengths and weaknesses are kind of uh, brought to the forefront. And when you have a couple of siblings, it, it seems that, they, that their relationship it really brings out their personality. That, that Riley, for example, I, I wouldn't know Riley nearly as well as I do 
if Nathan and Laney weren't around and vice versa. You can kind of draw off of that. You can see those things. You can see the, 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 the comparing and contrasting the siblings. It, it really teaches us more about each of them. Well, the same thing is true in the passage of Scripture that we're focusing on today. If you have a Bible, turn it to Luke 15. And we're spending an entire month soaking in the parable of Jesus known as the prodigal son. And last week I asked you to read the prodigal son at least once a day. How many at least wrote, read it once this past week? Raise your hand. I want to give you props. All right, that's good. I want every hand up next week, okay? You, you got a chance. We're going to be four weeks into this. So read Luke chapter 15, 11 through 32. Uh, try to do it once a day. It's not that hard. Uh, and and let it, let's soak in it together. But, but we're spending the entire month just kind of soaking in this and, and dwelling in the parable, if you will. And of course, in that parable, there are two sons. And while the story could be seen as entertaining, I mean, it's a pretty fun, good story. But the purpose of the parable, of course, is to be educational. That Jesus is teaching an important truth, and he's comparing and contrasting the two siblings uh, in this parable, and that helps us learn about more what Jesus, uh, what Jesus is teaching. If we can take those two brothers and compare them and contrast them, we really see what Jesus was trying to say. So follow along as I read the parable to you, Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's pray. God, again, I just pray that you will be with us today. And as we look into this parable, this passage of Scripture, that you will just let us see it with fresh eyes and, and help us to see the message you are teaching and help us to put ourselves in the story and to see how we are to respond and react to you and your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, imagine for a moment if the two fictional brothers that were in Jesus' parable uh, were up on stage like our previous siblings were, and they had their whiteboards, and, and we, you know, we asked them some of the same questions. Uh, if I was to ask them to describe their brother's personality in one word or phrase, then one brother, the older brother, might say his younger brother is kind of a party animal, right? That seems kind of the, a, a word that he would use based on what we learned in, the, in this passage of Scripture. Perhaps the younger brother would say that his, his older brother is kind of a stick in the mud, a guy that's just always doing the right thing, a goody-goody two-shoes that, that's, that's always, you know, uh, suck it up to mom and dad and, and, and acting just the way that you're supposed to. And so you could see that their, their personalities would be different. And if I asked which brother was the good brother, then I think there's little doubt that both would probably say that the good brother was the older brother, that they knew that that's kind of his role, that's his place. And if I asked which brother got the most attention, then surely they both would agree that it was the younger brother. Because, of course, we, as we talked about last week, th this, is called, this parable is known as the prodigal son. 
We focus on the younger brother. He is the one that gets the most attention, the most uh, uh, focus. And he's the one that gets the most time in the parable as far as uh, the telling of his story. And he's the one that gets the party at the end of the story. And so he's the one that gets the most attention. But today we're going to focus on the older brother just a little bit. And I think the best way to do that is to compare and contrast him with his younger brother. We all know his younger brother. We talked about his younger brother last week. And so the best way to really learn about the older brother is to kind of compare the two and see uh, what similarities and differences they have. But the interesting thing about this story is that Jesus doesn't compare and contrast the brothers in this parable based on their relationship with one another. They don't have any interaction with one another in this parable, but we learn about the differences and similarities between the brothers based on the interactions with the third character of this story, the father. That's how we learn to compare and contrast the two brothers is by how they interact with their father. And what we find is that while there are some stark differences between the younger brother and the older brother, that when you dig deep into the reality that Jesus was teaching in Luke chapter 15, what we find is that the two brothers really weren't that different at all. They really weren't all that different You see, while we might look at the experience of the younger brother and we might see a picture of a lost son in a desperate and dangerous circumstance, I believe that if we take a deeper look at the teaching of Jesus, that he is saying that the the picture we have of the older brother is just as desperate and just as dangerous. For example, we see the similarities and differences between the two brothers. The first thing is that the brothers, they had different behavior, but they had the same motivation. Different behavior, but the same motivation. I need, let's see, I need a, a young, youngster that really, really likes Snickers. There's a few of them, okay. All right, why don't you, Dakota, and come on back, you, got, you two come on up here, guys. Come on up here. All right, I'd, I'd ask you to give them a hand, but one of them is going to get a Snickers, so they don't deserve a hand for that, do they? All right, come on up, guys. I'm going to give one of you the Snickers. Let's see, who, who is my favorite today? Uh, I think it's going to be him. Sorry, Dakota. Okay, now come here, Dakota. Let's talk for a second. You stand over there and hold that up so everybody can see because it's your glorious Snickers. Now, you want that Snickers? You were the first hand to go up. I know you want that Snickers. Do you want that Snickers? So let's talk about this. What do you think we could do to get that Snickers from him? What are some ideas that we could do? How would we do it? Well, you can break it in half. That's a, that's a very tr- Sunday school thing to say. I appreciate that. Okay, but, but we want the whole thing. We don't want to share. So, so um, you really, really want that Snickers. What are some ways that you could get that Snickers from him? Trick him. Trick him. How, how, you know, trick him into giving it to you? All right. What else could you do? Could you maybe, I think I'm bigger than him. I think I could take him. I think I could beat him up and you could take his Snickers. We could do that, couldn't we? What about, uh, what if you asked it, you could ask him nicely, right? You could do that. Maybe you could um, just beg and plead that he gives you the Snickers. And there's, those are some ways that you could, you could do that. Now, here's another way you could do it. Do you like him? He's a pretty cool kid, right? Okay, so you, here's what you could do, though. You could say, if you give me that Snickers, I will be your best friend forever. Would, he already is. Okay, good. <laughs> those are some ways you could do that, right? Okay, well, here. I'll give you a Snickers. You guys can go sit down, all right? Give him, a, give him a hand for helping out. The thing about that is, is that if he promised that to be his best friend, and let's, think, let's say they didn't like each other. And they didn't like each other at all, and he had the Snickers, and then he promised, they could have promised to be his best friend forever and ever and ever if he just gave him the Snickers. Would you believe him? You, you probably wouldn't believe him, right? Because what, what is he trying to get? He's trying to get the Snickers. That's all he cares about is the Snickers. And see, what we see in this parable, in this parable, uh, the brothers in this parable only really cared about the father's Snickers. That's all they really cared about. All they really cared about was the father's stuff. Both of them had this selfish desire to have the father's things for themselves and enjoy those things to the fullest, but they tried to get them in different ways. The father is there with the Snickers, and the two brothers want to get the Snickers from him, and so they, 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 they try different uh, tactics to get the stuff of the father. The younger brother, he first demanded to get his share of the estate and then uh, to, to, to let him spend it the way he wanted to. 
That's, that was the, the younger brother's tactic that he said, I, I, I want my stuff now. Give it to me and I'm going to go spend it the way I want to. As we talked about last week, that the younger brother wanted the blessings of the father, but he did not want the father himself. And we know that very well, but when you look at it, the older brother, on the other hand, he did take a different approach. You know, instead of being rude or demanding, he stuck around. And he obeyed the father, and he worked for the father. But soon we see that those efforts were not much more than the older son trying to manipulate the father to get what he wanted. We see that the older brother cares about the father's stuff, but the older brother doesn't care about the father's heart. And that's a very important thing to see, a very important thing to understand. You know, I can almost see the older brother with a smirk on his face. The younger brother has come and he says, I want my stuff now, dad, and I wish you were dead. Just give me my stuff so I can go and live my life the way I want to. And so the father, certainly heartbroken, says, okay, and he sells his land or possessions or whatever, and he liquidates his assets, and he gives it to his, his younger son, and the son takes off. And you can almost see the, the, the pain in the father's eyes, but you can almost sense the older brother sitting back and going, all right, I got this now. There is no way that I'm not going to be the favorite son. This younger son, this younger brother of mine, he, he, he insults his father. He insults his family. But you know what? Even though it, it's a bad deal, it's really a good deal for me. Because now, I'm just, I, I, all i got to do is just kind of stick around and just be a son. And I'm going to get the, all the stuff that the father, that my dad has. I'm going to get it. He's going to give it to me. Not only that, but he's going to tell me how awesome I am. And he's going to heap praise upon me because I'm the one that, that, that's the good son. I'm the one that's paying attention to him and, and, and sticking around and working for him. And I'm doing everything he says. And so, man, you know, the father, his heart is broken. But I can just imagine that the older brother sat back with kind of a restrained jubilation over what had happened. Because now, he is, without a doubt, the good son. But as the older brother continues to toil away and obey his father, things don't turn out the way that he expected or he intended. He obeys his father. He works hard for his father. And, he, and, and surely, surely the father probably let him you know, have some of his stuff. And, and it wasn't like he had a hard life necessarily uh, or a bad life. But it wasn't what he expected. He thought the floodgates would be opened. And he certainly wasn't getting the, the heaps of praise that he thought that he was going to get. You know, he was working, working every day, and it was just, there was hardly a, even a thank you, not hardly even a pat on the back. And not only that, the father had not forgotten about the younger son. Not only that, but, but the father each and every day would go to the walk, uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the road coming into the estate, just to look and see if the younger son was coming back. And the older son said, Dad, you've got to give it up you got to let go. And, and he knew in his heart that as long as his dad held on to that, he was going to be distracted from the really important thing, which was him. As long as his father uh, focused on this lost son and, and thought about that lost son, he was wasting energy that he could be heaping praise upon the older brother. And so the father kept looking, and, and, he, and the older brother wasn't getting what he wanted, and the father still looks for that deadbeat son every day, and one day, there's a silhouette of the distance. And here comes the son back again. And the father is overwhelmed with joy. He's so very excited because now his son has come home. And, and he throws the biggest party, the biggest celebration the community has ever seen. But instead of joining his father in celebration and joy, the older son's had enough. And Anger and bitterness overflows and it reveals his true heart. And at this, all this time, he toiled away and he stuck by his father's side. But not only did he not get a physical gift anywhere close to the party that was being thrown for this lost brother, but now the younger son was getting all the attention that he always needed, needed and want, thought he deserved. This party was everything the older brother had wanted throughout this course of time that, that had passed. And so it becomes blatantly obvious that the only reason the older son was good is because he thought it would get him what he wanted. He thought it would get him the father's stuff, the father's accolades, the father's praise. And so the behavior was different, but the motivation was exactly the same. 
See, the younger son might have been more bold in his selfishness, but the older son had the exact same motivation. Both sons loved the father's stuff, but neither one of the sons loved the father. The younger son certainly didn't love the father when he said, I wish you were dead. I want my stuff now, and I'll, I'll live it the way I want to. Thank you very much. And the older son certainly didn't love the father when he didn't mourn with his father when the, when the younger brother left, and he didn't celebrate with his father when the younger son returned. There was no love. There was no sharing in the heart of the father. And so the young son took, took this uh, path of self-discovery, that I'm going to do what's best for me, and that's what's going to bring me happiness and joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. And the older brother took a different path. It was a path of moral conformity that he was going to live life the way that he was supposed to in the little box that he had. Uh, he was going to obey. He was going to do all the things he should do. But the, his point of doing that was that maybe I can get the satisfaction and the stuff and the fulfillment and all that that I want. But Jesus said that both paths will leave us empty and alienated from the Father. He had different motivation or different behavior, but the same motivation. They also had different perspectives, but the same attitude. I love how, how God's Word is both simple and complex at the same time. And, and, I, and what I really love about spending time in, in one passage like we're doing for these, these four weeks is that passages that you've seen and read and, and studied and heard all your life, God will, will use a little nugget in there and bring it out and, and, and let you see that, perhaps like it's the first time or a little different piece of God's truth that will emerge to you. And one of the things that has stuck out to me as I focused on this parable the last couple weeks was the attitude of the younger son when it came to approaching the father. And as I mentioned last week, the younger son, uh, when he was asking the father to be made like one of his hired men, it, that meant something very specific, and it really exposed his view of reconciliation. We talked about it last week, but it bears repeating that in Jesus' time, the economy was such that when you had a huge estate like the father in this parable, there were several types of workers on that estate. And they were kind of ranked by different, you know, by their jobs and by their, their importance and by their place in the family and things of that nature. And so way up here would have been the father and then the father's sons and so on, uh, all, the, all the family. And then down here, you'd have the slaves and, or the servants, and they would be the ones that would uh, really be a part of the extended family. It wasn't slaves as much as we think of in the terms of, uh, that we're used to, but it was a, a servants that were part of the extended family that were cared for. They didn't receive uh, um, a salary, but they lived on the estate. And then there was the hired servants, the hired men. And these guys were the ones that, that didn't live on the estate, and they had pretty menial jobs, and they got a paycheck. They were paid for their activities. And so essentially, the younger son's request, when he said, make me like one of your hired men, first of all, it was, it was absolutely a, a request of humility, that he didn't want to be restored to the place of importance. He wanted to be the lowest of the low. That's what he thought he deserved, and that's what he wanted to do. But it was also something different. The request was not just a request of humility. It, was all, it also indicated that the, that the son wanted to repay the father. The rabbis made very clear when there is a sin or an infraction against the family or the community, thank you or sorry was not enough. Sorry would not cut it. You couldn't just apologize and expect to be restored. There had to be restitution for your transgressions. He knew it. He had that ingrained into his head from the time he was a little boy. And so this boy going back, he, he, he asked his father to be a hired man so he could start earning a paycheck. And so he could start paying his father back the inheritance that he squandered to make good his transgressions against the father. And so the younger son was saying to the father, help me deserve to be called your son again because he believed that sonship needed to be earned. That's what the younger brother was saying. Help me to earn my way back into your life. Help me to earn my way to be, back, uh, to be your son once again. Well, it seems that the older brother believed the exact same thing. Look again at verse 28. It says, The older brother became angry and refused to go in, so his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, 
All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never, never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. You know, for the longest time, I kind of thought that this response from the older brother showed how upset he was at the younger brother. You know, that he was mad about what the younger brother had done, and he'd squandered all this, and he had jealousy and all that kind of stuff, and a lack of compassion. I mean, uh, and there's probably some of that there. I believe that's probably the case. It would have been added to the intensity of his anger, but now it seems quite clear to me that this anger and bitterness that, that the older brother is, is exhibiting here, it has very little to do with the younger brother. And it has every much are very much directed, it's very much directed at the father. That his anger and bitterness, it's not about what his brother did or didn't do. His anger and bitterness is at the father. You see, the older brother was angry because just like the younger son, he misunderstood how sonship was obtained. And so while the younger brother said, help me deserve to be called your son again because he believed he needed to earn his sonship, the older brother said, give me what I deserve because he had already believed that he had earned that sonship. He believed that sonship had to be earned and it, and it came from a, an obedient son who stuck by his father and did what his father's will was and, and, and obeyed his father's wishes and he thought, I've done that all my stinking life. So give me what I deserve. I am your son. That that guy over there, he's, I don't even know what he is. I won't even call him my brother. I won't call him my name. I, won't call, I don't know what he is, but I have earned it. I am your son. And the point Jesus is making here is that both brothers are wrong. Both of the brothers are dead wrong. That the younger son could never earn back his sonship because that relationship is only established or reestablished by the grace of the father. And the older son could never earn his sonship because no amount of good deeds would make him worthy, but only the grace of the father. Different perspectives, same attitude. And the reality of the older brother's request is quite troubling if you think about it. You know, we live in a, in a country who is pretty big on what rights we have and what we deserve and what we can and can't do. And I think that's kind of messed us up a little bit, to be honest. Because if you go to God and say, give me what I deserve, you better watch out. You better watch out. And this son, if the father was to truly give him what he deserved, it would have resulted in the older brother's demise. It would have resulted in complete and final removal from the family. That's what this older, disrespectful son deserved in this moment. I, I've shared this before, and I think it's so appropriate, though. You know, you've probably heard someone say that uh, there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. And I think it's based on the, on, on the prodigal son in a lot of ways. You know, you've got this example of a guy who went out and did all this stuff, and yet the father was still exuberant, excited to see his son come back. And there was nothing you can do. There's no sin so despicable that's going to make God go, never mind, I don't want you anymore. There's no sin. There's no selfish. There's nothing out there that, where God's going to say, oh, no, it's too dirty for me. I don't want to mess with that. There's nothing you can do to make God love you less. You know, I never had an issue with that. I'm cool with that. I, 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 I'm all right with that. I'm all right with God accepting everybody and accepting all my sin. And, and, and there's no, I don't have any problem with that. But there's another side to that coin. It's the part that says that you could also never do anything to make God love you more. I'm a church boy. I have a little more problem with that one. I go to church. I've been to church. I've, I go, every time the doors are open, I go to church. I've read my Bible. I've had my quiet time and done my journaling and all the churchy stuff that we do. And, and you know, I think, man, if I do all that stuff, it's not easy. I just think maybe, you know, maybe God's going to put me up the ladder a little bit. But that's not how it works. That's not how it works. I struggle with that, that there's nothing, yeah, there's nothing I can do to make God love me less, but there's nothing I can do to make God love me more. And that's what the older brother was struggling with. And so what do you do? What can you do when nothing you can do can make God love you less and nothing you can do can make God love you more? What do you do when that's the case? Well, I think what we do is we praise God for not giving us what we deserve. And then it said that he did give us sonship 
through his son Jesus. And we do the only thing that we can do when we can't God, make God love us less and we can't make God love us more. We do the only thing that's possible and that's where we rely completely and totally on God's grace. Rely on his grace. And we see that grace in this parable, by the way. Because the brothers both had different locations, but they had the same invitation. As soon as the younger son was giving his, given his inheritance, verse 13 tells us that he takes off. That he goes to a faraway country. And the implication here is that he just wants to get away, as far away from the father as he possibly can. He's going to leave. He's going to run. He doesn't want to be in, in, in walking distance. He wants to be so far away, out of sight, out of mind. The old man's out of my life. That's what he was, his intentions were. On the other hand, we see an older son who stays near the father, stays close to the father. He hangs out with the father. He works for the father. He's near the father, and he's, at, he's about his father's business all the time. Yet he is just as far away from the father as the younger son. Just as far away as the, as the, as the younger son. I, I, I got to tell you, I, church, I really believe we got to stop pretending that proximity to God is relationship with God. That if we're just in God's house of this building, the church building, or if we are about God's business and, and we do all these things, that that means that we're, we're in a relationship. And you know, what the, what the older son said reminds me a lot of what Jesus said in, in Matthew 7 where he said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And they're going to say, but, but, but God, it's me. I was in your church building every Sunday. And it's me. I, I helped feed the poor. I helped do this. I helped, you know, we did this outreach events and this, that, and the other. And, and, and the striking thing that Jesus says at the end of that passage in Matthew 7 is that, away from me, I don't know you, you evildoer. Proximity is not enough. The older son was, was close in proximity to the father, but he was just as far away in relationship from the father as the younger son was. And we cannot miss out on this important aspect of the parable because the father, he throws the feast. And if you read throughout the scripture, uh, the idea of eating and fellowship with one another and this idea of celebrating and a feast, it's something that God uses a lot. And it's much more than just a celebration of a younger son coming home. This is not just a party that was done for his behalf. What it was was the father was throwing this party because the family was reestablished in the way that it was supposed to be that it was, reconciliation was there, and that all the family was together as the Father had intended. It's a picture of the fulfillment of God's plan for mankind, that those who have been made uh, children of God by the grace of God will be with God. We read about it in Revelation 21, verses 3 and 4, where it says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And we will eat with God, and we will drink with God, and we will party with God, and we will dance with God, and we will sit with God, and we will be with God, and we will be with one another. And it will be as God intended. Creation will be restored to the way God intended. And what a celebration that will be. But notice that even though the younger son ran far away from the father and the older son stuck close, that they both had to be invited to come into the feast. You see, both sons had disrespected the father. The younger son, as we've talked about, basically went to the father and said, I wish you were dead. I have no use for you. You're worth more to me dead than alive. Give me my stuff so I can go do my thing. For the original audience that heard this parable, that would have been just outrageous. But the older son also publicly disgraces his father at the feast. You don't turn down a Middle Eastern patriarch, his invitation to come eat, particularly in Jesus' time. Tim Keller wrote, He refuses to go in to what is perhaps the biggest feast and public event his father has ever put on. He remains outside the door, publicly casting a vote of no confidence in his father's actions. This forces the father to, father to come out to speak to his older son, a demeaning thing to do, have to do when you are the lord of the manor and a host of a great feast. Here is the, the one who's throwing the feast at the head table of the sinner, and, 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 and he's got to get up. And go talk to his son, who is publicly, he might as well have had a picket sign out in front of the feast. 
And once the father goes out, he's met with further disrespect. He doesn't call him father. He doesn't say, speak to his father with a loving tone. He says, look, you. Look. I've had enough of you, old man. And then further on, he doesn't even acknowledge his brother. He doesn't say, my brother. He doesn't say, he says, this son of yours. It's kind of like, you know, when parents fight about kids and your son, that's what we're talking about here. There's disrespect. And this disrespect, in that disrespect, both sons exhibit their alienation from the father. But here's the great news. As the father doesn't give up on either one of them. When the young son appears, the father foregoes all sense of respectability that a man of his stature would normally maintain, and he lifts up his skirt and runs down the the road to, to, to meet his son. And he falls on his neck, the Greek text says. He just collapses on his son who's covered in who knows what from the pigsties and the journey. And there's just no respectability because he's overwhelmed with excitement and love for his son. And so he, he forgoes all that sense of respectability when he does that. But the older son, when the older son does not show up at the head table, then the father does the same thing. And he gives up all sense of respectability and he humbles himself and he goes to the older son and says, Hey, Will you please, please come in. Please come in to the feast and and be a part of the family as I have intended. They both have the same invitation from the Father. Please come be my son and join in the celebration. There's something quite disturbing about how this parable ends. You know, both both of the sons in this parable are offered the same invitation. And we have one son, the younger son, uh, who, who uh, accepts the grace offered by the father. And, and, you know, they have the party and all that kind of stuff. But just as the father is pleading with the older brother to come into the celebration, Jesus just flat out stops. The father is pleading and you want, want to know what's going to happen. What, what, what does the older brother say? What does he say to his father? But Jesus doesn't tell us. He just stops. And, and so why wouldn't he tell the end of the story? I believe it's because it was up to the listeners to make up the end themselves. If you go back to the very first verse of this chapter in Luke chapter 15, starting with verse 1, we see the audience that Jesus was talking to. It said, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so the reality of Jesus' life and ministry is that sinners, look at the Gospels, sinners were drawn to Jesus. People who had messed up, broken, nasty lives were drawn to Jesus while it was the church people, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, they're the ones that had all together, they were the ones that were repulsed by Jesus. They were upset with Jesus, they were mad at Jesus. They rejected Jesus and his teachings. And so in this audience, we read that Jesus uh, had two groups of people. And the first group of people would have fit just about perfectly in the younger brother category. Tax collectors, sinners. Who knows what other sins they had struggled with. And and these are the ones that could absolutely identify with this younger brother. And Jesus knew that. And and these people were the ones that were coming to Jesus and accepting Jesus on a daily basis. and, and, And calling him Lord and calling him Savior. But then there was another group of people there. And it was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. It was the church people. And those church people, they fit right into the older brother category. And so when Jesus tells this parable, he says, look, here, we've got, we've got sinners here. And they have come and they are here and we are celebrating that. But you know what? Older brother types. Let's, I'm not mad. Just Just come. And he leaves it open-ended because he's looking for their response. You see, Jesus was once again redefining the concept of good and bad, as well as the concept of approaching God. Again, Tim Keller in his book, Prodigal God, said, "What What must we do then to be saved? To find God, we must repent of the things we have done wrong. But if that is all you do, you may remain just an elder brother. To truly become Christians, we must also repent of the reasons we ever did anything right. 
Pharisees only repent of their sins, but Christians repent for the very roots of their unrighteousness too. We must learn how to repent of the sin under all our other sins and under, our, under all our right, righteousness. The sin of seeking to be our own Savior and Lord. We must admit that we put our, our ultimate hope and trust in things other than God and that in both our wrongdoing and rightdoing, we have been seeking to get around God or get control of God in order to get a hold of these things. You see... Repentance not, doesn't mean just repenting for the wild living that we've done. It means repenting for the motivations that don't align with God's heart. And so the question this morning with this open-ended parable for us is that which brother are you? Which brother are you? Are you the younger brother? Are you the older brother? I got to tell you, I'm a little of both. <laughs> I'm a little of both. And the parable in our lives right now, when we put ourselves in that story, it, it, the truth is, is that it's open-ended. And knowing that we have done all the right things, maybe perhaps at times to manipulate God and to get what we want, or that we've tried to be our own righteousness, we've tried to be our own Savior, and we haven't made... We may have said that Jesus is our Savior, but we haven't made him our Lord. It's open-ended. No matter what our sin might be, God is saying, please, please, just be my son and come join the celebration. Let's pray. God, I just ask for forgiveness for our tendencies to try to be our own savior to manipulate you and help us to understand that that both the good and bad by the world standards uh, that we see in this parable the good son and the bad son and the the close son and the far son that that they were just as distant from you as as each other There, there was no difference help us to understand Lord that your grace is here for those of us who are a hundred miles away and for those that are just seemingly a foot away. But that when we are separated from you, that we are truly separated. Thank you for your grace that you've offered to us. And I pray that you'll help us to take advantage of that grace, to accept that grace, and to proclaim that grace to this world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.